330 in the Red Book. You can find one there close by. Page 330. The word at the bottom of the page says, I need thee every hour. Page 330 at the bottom. Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour. Stay Thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when Thou art nigh. I need Thee, oh, I need Thee. Every hour I need Thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour in joy or pain. Come quickly and abide, or life is vain. I need Thee, oh, I need Thee. Every hour I need Thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me Thine indeed, Thou blessed Son. I need Thee, oh, I need Thee. Every hour I need Thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. Don't we see? If you want to turn your Bible tonight to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to go back and read verse 17, really it's going to be verse 18 through 31, but... The title of the message tonight is Glory in the Lord. Glory in the Lord. This will be session two of our study here in the letter of 1 Corinthians. And um, just a quick review. This is a letter that is written by the Apostle Paul to the Christian church in the, in the Greek city of Corinth. Now, where did Paul write this letter from? Does anybody remember? Where was he at when he wrote this letter? Ephesus. He was, he was there in Ephesus. He spent about three years in Ephesus. Um, do you remember what year he wrote it, approximately? 50, oh, Gabe raised his hand. Yes. 55 AD. So Paul is in Ephesus. He's obviously not at Corinth when he writes this. He's at Ephesus, and it's around 55 AD. So this is after Paul had spent a year and a half at Corinth as a missionary and as a church planner around 50 to 51 AD. And so this is about four years later after he has gone there. He's preached the gospel. He's planted the church there. About four or five years later, word catches up with him that there are major problems, major issues at the church at Corinth. And so as we said last week, this letter is really all about problems. I mean, the entire content of this letter is about problems. And it's split up into five sections addressing five major problems at the church at Corinth. And the first problem that, that the first division, the first um, problem that we, that we find in this letter had to do with divisions and factions developing in the church around certain leaders or behind certain leaders. I understand that that Peter, Apollos, Paul, they really didn't have anything to do with this. this. This is what the church is choosing, that they're saying, I prefer Peter's teaching on this. I prefer Apollos. You know, I'm of the school of Paul. This is what the church is deciding to do. And the leaders do not seem to be, especially not, you know, you know Paul, but I don't think it's true for Peter or Apollos as well, that they're not um, complicit in this. This is what the church is doing, is they're dividing up into these factions. And so that's the problem that Paul is addressing, these divisions, these factions that are developing in the church there at Corinth around or behind certain leaders. So we come to um, chapter 1, verse 17 through 24. If you would please stand in honor of God's words and read this together. 
<clears throat> I want to pick up in verse 17 because really verses 18 through 31, Paul is expounding upon something he says in verse 17. Again, the title message tonight is Glory in the Lord. But we're going to see here that this is really the wisdom of God versus or and the wisdom of men. And Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Because, so he just said, you know, thankfully I didn't baptize many of you there at Corinth because you're, you know, you would think that that was, um, that, that that made you special or something like that, that you were baptized by Paul because you're dividing over these, these things that should not be divisive at all. And he says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now listen to what he says next. Not with wisdom of words. That's what verses 18 through 31 is going to expound upon. When he preached the gospel there at Corinth, it was not with, with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews that require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Let's Lord in prayer together. Father, we thank you, God, as always, for your word. God, there is, there is so much content in what we've just read and what we're going to read. God, I can already remember times in my ministry where I preached entire sermons on maybe one of these verses. There is so much here. There's so much to say. But God, I pray that you would help us tonight to in a very concise way, but also in a very thorough way that we would go through what is being said. That God, we would see uh, that we would go in like a, like a diamond mine, like a gold mine. And God, we would mine out, God, um, the, the riches that we find in this passage. What, what, this is, what is being said, what, what you are saying through your Holy Spirit, through the pen of the Apostle Paul, through this letter that, that he has written to the Corinthians, that God, that we could mine out the treasures that are found here, God, the, the depths of the wisdom and the instruction and the teaching that they are receiving, God, that we know is also, that it is also instructive for us here in America in the 21st century. So, Father, I pray that you would speak to us tonight, God, through your word, God, recognizing how, how deep it is. I pray, God, that I can cover this as concisely, but yet as thoroughly as possible, and that, Father, you would help each one of us to grow in our understanding, and that, God, we could use the lessons we learn through these letters, through the problems there at Corinth, and, and how that these things are contrary to the gospel, but how that there is a gospel solution to each of these problems, that God, we can then use that and apply that in our life to see how the gospel instructs us in everything, how that we can find instruction and wisdom and solutions to every problem in life found in the gospel and found in your son, Jesus Christ, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Be seated. So what Paul is expounding on here when he says, it's not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. He's saying that the power of the cross does not rest in the skill or the cleverness with which the message is presented. Now understand that these are Greeks. They, they, are, they are the wild, in their, in their mind, and really in... In a lot of ways, they are the wisest men in the entire world. Now, Chinese historians may dispute that. The Chinese are pretty, pretty wise themselves in the things that they were doing at this time 2,000 years ago. But basically, these, this culture, this Greek culture within the Roman Empire, but this Greek culture, they see themselves as the wisest of the wise, the wisest society, the wisest men to, really to ever live is how they're viewing themselves. And, and they put a lot of, of, on, uh, excuse me, of emphasis on the skill and the cleverness with which a message can be presented. And Paul is saying, I reject every bit of that. That is, that is the opposite of what I'm doing. 
He is saying the power of the cross does not rest in the skill or the brilliance or the cleverness with which the message is presented, but rather the power of the message of the cross of Christ is simply this. It's true. Period. He's saying it doesn't matter how, if I can describe this in some brilliant and eloquent way, here's what matters is it's true. Period. The cross really was everything that it claims to be. Jesus Christ really is the Son of God. He really is sinless. His death upon the cross, giving His life as the infinite Son of God, really is the sufficient payment for our sin against an infinitely holy God. It is the only payment for sin, the only solution to the human condition of fallenness, of brokenness, of evil. And He really did die upon that cross, and that cross, and what His death really was, the payment for our sin to justify the wrath of God, and He really rose again on the third day. Every bit of that is true. That is the power of the cross. Not in how, in what kind of clever way Paul could present it. The power of the cross is, is that it is true. But the message of a crucified God, now think about in a, in a Greek mindset, when you talk about God, they think more in terms of gods. They're thinking about about the, the Greek pantheon, they're thinking about, about Zeus, about, you know, think about Greek mythology, Roman mythology at this time. And so the idea of a crucified God is absurd to them. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But the idea of a crucified Savior, if He's a Savior, how did He get Himself crucified? How's He saving people while being crucified? I mean, this was the lowest of the low. This, is, this was reserved for the worst of the worst criminals. This form of execution, you know, at least He could have received the dignity of a stoning or a beheading, but He was crucified? A crucified Savior? And for the Jews, a crucified Messiah? It seems unbelievable. In fact, it seems ridiculous. It seems like foolishness to them. But as Paul references here, God foretold 600 years earlier through the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 14, that he would destroy the wisdom of the wise, and he would bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. God already said that was his intention. So what you see here is that there is a showdown between the wisdom of God and the wisdom of men. Verse 20, Paul writes and says, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? This is a showdown. God is calling out, the wisdom of God is calling out the wisdom of men. What he's saying is, bring out the philosopher. Bring out Socrates, bring out Plato, bring out Aristotle, bring out the philosopher, and beside of him bring out the scholar and the expert in the law, and bring out the debater, bring out the wisest men to ever live. Bring, I mean, bring out the absolute pinnacle, bring out Einstein in our day, bring out the wisest of the wise, and ask him this question, why do you exist? What is the meaning of life? As Socrates, who is still influencing Western philosophy in our culture to this day, having lived 25, 2600 years ago, or excuse me, 2300 years ago, bring out the philosopher, bring out the scholar, bring out the debater, bring out the wisest men to ever live and ask them, why do you exist? What is the meaning of life? How did you get here? Where are you going? What is the solution to the human condition? Do you believe that there's evil? You, if you do, if you affirm that there is, what's the solution for evil? You know what their answer is? Dead silence. They have absolutely no answer. To this day, they have no answer in the wisdom of this world or the wisdom of men. Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? The most basic, fundamental questions. If you can't answer those, what do you care about the other questions? The origin of existence, the origin of the universe, of time, space, and matter, the origin of life, the origin of consciousness. No answer to any of those questions. 
God has, as he says there, hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? I think that's even more true today than it was when Paul wrote this. More wisdom has been gained, more research has been done, more has been learned. But those big questions that I just, I just mentioned, rattle off, there's many more you could mention, still go unanswered. Because you cannot, it is not through human wisdom that we will find the answer to these most fundamental questions, the big questions of life. Verse 21, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. It was in God's wisdom that he chose that salvation would not come by human wisdom. We will not run an experiment. We will not develop some type of new instrumentation in order to, there will not be a new invention or a new discovery of how we, that, that's not how we're going to discover or how we're going to, to find out salvation. It was in God's wisdom that he chose that salvation would not come by human wisdom, but rather the foolishness of the preaching of the cross. So that basically it comes down to this. Men will either humble themselves or they will face the wrath of God forever. And God has intentionally set it up this way. You will either fall down and worship a crucified Savior or you'll face the wrath of God forever. Do you know why God set it up that way? Because he absolutely hates human pride and he is set for the destruction of human pride. That is why God has set it up that way. It's not by coincidence, it's not by accident, it is by design that we must humble ourselves and all stand on level footing at the foot of the cross to say, Jesus Christ is my salvation and all glory goes to him. If you're not willing to say that, you will die and go to hell, period. There's a lot of brilliant people today who just can't accept this and they're going to die and go to hell because of it. It's their pride. It's not their intellect. It's their pride. They will not humble themselves to worship a crucified Savior, and they will face the wrath of God as a result. God has nothing but contempt for human pride. In fact, we read in Scripture that God says that He resists the proud. If you are prideful, you will find yourself nose to nose with the infinite God, and you're going to lose. God resisteth the proud, but what else? He giveth grace to the humble. That's true. And that is built in by design through the infinite mind of God, built in by design into salvation. That salvation is through the cross of Christ. It requires humility to accept it. You come to verses 22 through 23. For the Jews require a sign that the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we, we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. The Jews want a sign. You know what Jesus said to that? No. Show us a sign. No. That's what Jesus said. He said, I'll give you one sign. You know what sign that was? He said, it's the sign of the prophet Jonah, who was three days in the belly of the whale. Do you know what he was pointing to? His death. His death. How many days did Jesus spend in the grave? You know, I've heard that, I, I'd never considered this, and I don't know if this is true or not, but um, I think, it, I can't remember the guy's name, the pastor who brought this up, but um, a belief that basically Jonah died in the belly of the well, and God had to raise him back up. He, he, he was alive long enough to cry out to God, to be humble to that point, that he cried out to God for deliverance, but that basically that he died and God had to bring him back to life as he was spit out on the shore. Now, I don't, I don't, it doesn't say that in the text, but, but that would make sense with the reference that Christ makes when he says you'll receive one sign, and that's the sign of Jonah, who is three days in the belly of a whale. And, and just, just like that, Christ would be three days in the belly of the earth, buried, but then would rise again. And so Jesus refuses, as the Jews require, required a sign, Jesus said, no, the only sign you'll get is the sign of Jonah, pointing to his death, burial, and resurrection, which is the crucified Messiah. A crucified Messiah was a stumbling block. And the Greek word for that stumbling block means, means that it was a scandal to the Jews. In the mind of a Jewish person, they basically were saying, 
the Messiah is supposed to show up and crush the Romans. This guy was crushed by the Romans. He's the opposite of Messiah. The Messiah is a political deliverer. He's going to reestablish the kingdom of Israel, sit upon the throne of David. He's supposed to crush the Romans. He's supposed to crush our oppressors, not be crushed by the Romans as Christ was. He's supposed to be anointed, not accursed. And we know that cursed is everyone who hangeth upon a tree. But what Paul clearly teaches is this, and he says this in Galatians, Jesus was accursed for us because we are cursed. I mentioned a few weeks ago, we were talking about Haiti. I said, it's like Haiti is cursed. But you know what? They are cursed. It's not as if they're cursed. They are cursed. Afghanistan is cursed. India is cursed. America is cursed. You are cursed. We live in a cursed world. But Christ became an accursed for us to take our penalty. He was crucified. He was hung upon a tree. And he was a curse for us who are cursed. This was a stumbling block to the Jews. It was foolishness to the Greeks. And, and by Greeks, it, it extends beyond just the Greeks themselves, but really to the Gentile world. You have two quick categories, Jews and Greeks. It was foolishness to the Greeks, to the Gentiles, that a God, again, they're thinking about, they're thinking about Zeus, they're thinking about, uh, you know, Egyptian gods or Roman gods or, or Greek gods. This idea that a God could, could take on flesh, could, could take on a human nature and die to bring salvation was complete foolishness to them. And Paul recognized that. But he comes down to verse 24 and says, But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. What he's saying is, but God is calling out people to himself from among both the Jews and the Greeks, or the Gentiles. So out of the, out of the Jews and the Gentiles, God is calling out people to himself, to whom God is revealing his power and wisdom in Christ. Coming down to verse 25. It says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. That's a very strange thing to say. Does God have foolishness? Does God have weakness? What Paul is saying here is that God, this is the situation, is we're comparing, you know, God's wisdom and human wisdom. What Paul is saying is this, God's most insignificant thought is infinitely wiser than humankind's most profound and brilliant and significant thought. It's not even a contest. He's saying God on his worst day is far more brilliant, infinitely more brilliant and wiser than we could ever hope to be. It is ridiculous to have human, to, to boast in human wisdom. That's what's absurd. The cross is not foolishness. Foolishness is to boast in human wisdom, especially in light of the infinite wisdom of God. That's what Paul is calling down here in verse 25. Verse 26 through 28. Paul goes on and says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh... Not many mighty, not many noble are called, called by God. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things that are not to bring to naught things that are. Of those that God is calling... What Paul is pointing out, he's saying, of those to whom God is calling them out, not many of them, notice it doesn't say zero, but, but not many of them are from the philosopher's class. These are pretty specific terms that Paul's using. When he says, how you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh... He's talking about those who were seen, they were, they were the philosophers. They were, in Greek society, which was seen as, as the wisest, most, um, you know, I guess, dignified society, that uh, even amongst the wise, these philosophers were the wise amongst the wise. He's saying that there's not many that are called from that class of people, from the philosopher's class. And he goes on and says, 
that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, he's talking about those who were politically powerful, those who had might, political might, not many mighty, not many noble. Not many of those who were born into the upper class, into the aristocracy of society are called. What Paul is pointing out is this, that you, he's saying you recognize that God has not chosen the social or political or intellectual elite. He has passed them over. But rather, those of low birth... He goes on and says, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things and those things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Rather, God has chosen those of low birth. Back in this society, do you know how Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire? It spread through women. You'll, you'll notice this over and over again in the book of Acts. Even, even at the resurrection of Jesus, how it involves women are the first witnesses of the resurrection and the first to go and proclaim the resurrection. God's chosen women who are marginalized, who are seen as second-class citizens. God has chosen women. You think about Lydia. You think about um, diff different women that were saved through the, the ministry of the Apostle Paul. God has chosen women. He's chosen slaves. And he's chosen the poor. That is how Christianity spread. It spread throughout the Roman Empire and took over and conquered the Roman Empire through the lowest classes of people, through the lower classes. God has chosen those not of, not of the upper class or of noble birth, but those of low birth. God has chosen. What he's saying is that Christ is turning this evil world upside down. As you go all the way back to the very beginning when he said, you think about Matthew chapter 5 when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Christ is turning this evil world upside down. And every bit of this, all of this, God's purpose, his design in doing this, the way that he has done it, is for one reason, for one purpose, and to this end. Verse 29, we'll finish with this. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God has made into us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So as we have mentioned before, that what Paul is doing through this letter is he's identifying the problem, and he is, he is showing how that the problem there at the church at Corinth the problem is that what they're doing is contrary to the gospel. So how is this contrary to the gospel? What they're doing and how is the gospel the solution to this problem at Corinth? Applying the gospel will fix this problem at Corinth. How is that so? Well, this problem of factions, of glorying in human teachers, the way that this is contrary to the gospel is this. Thinking we are wiser than God. That we are wise and that God is unwise. That is exactly what brought about the fall. You go all the way back to Genesis 3. Why do we even need salvation? Because we thought we were wiser than God. That we were wise and God was unwise. God was making a mistake by telling us not to take the tree of the knowledge, notice the knowledge, of good and evil. We desired that knowledge, we desired that wisdom, and God was unwise for not giving it to us, for making it prohibitive for us to take it. This goes all the way back to the fall. Focusing on ourselves rather than God. Self-centeredness rather than God-centeredness. That is where the fall came from. I'll put it this way, focusing on the creation, its wisdom and glory. What did Eve see when she saw the fruit, the commentary that's given, what does it tell us that she thought? She saw that, the, that it was good for food, and it was good to do what? To make one wise. 
she was focused upon the glory and the wisdom of the creature rather than the glory, the infinite glory and wisdom of the creator. She was blinded to the infinite glory and wisdom of God and became fixated on the glory and the wisdom of men, of the creation, of the creature. Believing we are wiser than God led to the fall. And you think, well, that goes way back, and it is so central, it's so foundational. But then it comes up to, to tonight, right now, August 22nd, 2021. Believing we are wiser than God led to the fall, and it keeps people in a fallen state to this very second. Do you want to know why people that you know that are lost are lost? Because they think they're wiser than God. It keeps people in a fallen state to this very day. Glorying in men is the exact opposite of how gospel people should live. What Paul is saying is this, you, are, you have believed the gospel, you're gospel people. What you're doing is the exact opposite of the gospel. Glorying in human teachers and in ourselves is the exact opposite of the gospel. Why do I say that? As Christians, we profess that all glory belongs to who? To who? To God. Maybe more specifically, it belongs to Jesus Christ. All glory belongs to Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? Did the Corinthian Christians believe that? Did Paul believe that? So here's my question. How much glory is left? Zero. If all glory belongs to Jesus Christ, and it does, how, it's a math question. If 100% belongs to him, how much is left? None. Zero. How much glory does that leave for Paul? How much glory does that leave for me as your pastor? How much glory does that leave for you? Let me ask this question as well. Where would Paul be without Christ? Where would Peter be without Christ? Where would Apollos be without Christ? Where would I be as your as your the pastor at this church, one of the pastors at this church? Where would I be without Christ? Where would you be without Christ? All glory truly and factually belongs to Jesus. And this is what it comes down to. 100% of the glory belongs to Jesus. How much does that leave for us? We must rob Christ of his glory to glorify ourselves. If we, if I, or if you to glorify ourselves or others, when we glory in someone else or we glory in ourselves, in order to have that glory, we had to rob somebody who has all glory. That's how serious this is. He's saying to the Corinthians, you are robbing glory away from Jesus and giving it to Peter. You're robbing glory away from Christ and giving it to Apollos. Robbing glory away from Christ and giving it to Paul. You're robbing glory away from Christ and giving it to yourself. That is a huge deal. We must rob Christ to glorify ourselves or others. And that is the exact opposite of the gospel because the gospel tells us clearly that all glory... All glory, 100%, belongs to Christ. Therefore, he that glorieth, verse 31, let him glory in the Lord. That's the truth. That is factual. Truly, all glory belongs to Christ. That's the issue at Corinth, and that's how the gospel, that is how the gospel solves the problem when they remember all glory belongs to Christ, and that leaves none for anyone else. All glory belongs to him. We're going to end with that tonight.